Hi, it's Rebecca. You're listening to Super Women with Rebecca Minkoff. Before we get into this week's episode, I wanted to remind you about the giveaway we're doing for Reshma Sujani's new book, Brave Not Perfect. This book is inspired by her popular TED Talk and shows us how to break free from the trap of perfection and rewire ourselves for bravery. We are giving away five copies. This is how it's going to work. Take a screenshot showing that you've downloaded, rated, and reviewed Super Women with Rebecca Minkoff. Put it on your story. Tag me. I'll be going through it as they come in and picking out a couple of lucky winners. So get cracking. So when I was in LA a few months ago, I did a whole slew of podcast interviews and I was so excited to be able to interview Lauren Conrad and Hannah Squarla of The Little Market. You probably know of Lauren back from her days on the OC, her really hugely, whatever it is, successful clothing line, her best-selling New York Times books, and now her nonprofit called The Little Market. She started with Hannah. They have incredible artisanal goods that support women all over the world who do incredible, beautiful, handmade things that they showcase. The money goes back to these women, thus growing their communities and doing so much good. So take a listen with my interview with Hannah and Lauren. So hi, welcome. I am sitting with Lauren Conrad and Hannah Squarla, the co-founders of The Little Market. So I would love for listeners who are not familiar with The Little Market model, what is the concept behind it? And how did you guys start it? So The Little Market is a nonprofit. We started it about five years ago. And um, to explain it very simply, it's basically an online store that now we have a brick and mortar location as well, but we sell products made by female artisans all over the world and all of our pr- products are fair trade. Yeah, and every single item is handmade and we look specifically to work with women um, who are in need. So okay. women who were formerly homeless, women who had been trafficked, artisans with physical disabilities, refugees, just to name a few. So starting something like this, at least from the outside, seems like an incredibly huge undertaking. What what inspired you guys to start the little market and how did you sort of say, okay, we're going to do something that's probably going to be really hard? I mean, I, I, I want to say that we went into it a little naive, thinking it was going to be a lot simpler than it was. Um, but we also asked for a lot of help. You know, in the beginning, we actually partnered with a company that did something very similar and they helped us kind of find our way in the beginning, um, which was a huge help. We also you know, Hannah comes from Human Rights Watch. You know, her uncle is, is a lawyer and he helped us a lot. We, you know, we we kind of asked for help all over. Yeah, we definitely sought out people who had experience um, who could give us feedback and tell us kind of kind of show us the way, even though even though this didn't already exist. We really we leaned on as many people as possible to tell us um, kind of what to do and what not to do um, in starting a nonprofit. There are companies that sell especially five years ago i mean there was companies that sell you know products like this and have a similar mission what we really wanted to do was create a platform that was curated and we wanted to work with the groups to make sure that the products they were making they were easily saleable to as many people as possible so we wanted them to be things that we would put in our home or we would buy as gifts for other people um and not something that you would buy just because of the message behind it. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. Yeah. And yeah. to those who are listening, you know, the products are Instagram worthy. Uh, like you just want to buy everything. And it's true. You want them in your home. You know, they're not just like things that you picked up because it it gave back. It's like genuinely aesthetic, beautiful things. Not to say that other things aren't. It's just for, for consumers in other places. Yeah, it was really important to us that nobody had to compromise. Um and they could really feel good about the items they were buying and love them as well. So you've worked together for five years. I would love to talk about the co-founder relationship, how you guys <laughs> have worked together. I have a co-founder, so you know we're very open about the fact that we go to therapy together. I uh, love that. That's so nice. <laughs> we That's do. So healthy. Well, he's also my brother, so it complicates oh, it. I'll do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like, and yeah. So what's it like to work together? Well, before we started, my (laughs) therapist said, write down all of your expectations of what you think each other's roles are. And I remember when we flew to India, I had the spreadsheet of like, okay, I think I'm going to be doing this. I think you're going to be doing that. And we agreed on it and had everything, I mean, really, really even as detailed as product descriptions, you know, product design, product descriptions, really going over who's doing what. And I think to this day, that's been really helpful because there were really clear 
expectation set of who's doing what. And I think that really helps. And on top of that, we're really lucky that we have complementary skill sets. Lauren has such a strong design background. And I have more of a human rights background. So they really kind of paired well together. Yeah, I think, I mean, like she said, I think going into it with expectations. And I've, I've worked with friends before. Um, I've had it go really well and not so well. So I went into this just, you know, saying we have to be there has to be like open communication here. We just have to be very upfront. I don't want to promise you that I'm going to do things that I'm not going to do and then have you be disappointed later. We have a lot of fun. The team that Little Market has both, you know, at the the new store and even at the warehouse and everyone who works on the website, it's such such a great team. It's such good energy in there. Everyone's just happy to be there and wants to do good. And it's, it's such a great place to work. I would love to hear some of the funny stories uh, <laughs> that you have because you travel all over the world. You're sourcing all the time. Well, we so we haven't traveled outside of the U.S. in a minute because you're Hannah just had, a little busy. Well, no, yeah. Hannah had a baby. Yeah. And then I had a baby. Yeah. And then Hannah had a baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Zika was everywhere. And also we had little babies and it was hard, you know, for going to India or, um, you know, somewhere very, very far away. We want to go for a couple weeks at least. So it's kind of difficult. But before tiny people, we traveled a lot and it was so fun. And we're really excited to get back to it. And most of our funny stories have to do with me getting sick. Yeah. Because that happens almost every <laughs> every trip. And well, I get sick too, but Hannah gets sick more often. And it's yeah, it's always like a question. There's like a moment where like she'll go in really careful and like it's only packaged food and bottled water. Oh no. And then there's like a switch where it's like either like a fruit cart or like street corn will always get her. <laughs> I love Damn, street the street corn. Yeah. And you'll watch her do it and you're like, well, there's that. Oh, no. <laughs> now we're all sick. Yeah. There, I mean, we also, we obviously want to be very um, respectful of the fact that we're a nonprofit. So we're not, when we travel, we're not staying in the nicest places. We're definitely choosing places that we feel safe in, but there was like, well, where do we stay in India that was like $20? It wasn't great. That was my bad. <laughs> Well, I can share with you that I I get sick, too, when I travel. So right. you're not alone. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And my husband, actually, we were in Mexico, and I had to fly back a day early. And we were good the whole time. And then my husband felt the rumble. And mm. then my son, who was at the time, I think, two, and mm. they were flying back alone. It was also a snowstorm. And my husband crapped his pants. Oh, no. By on- the way, Hannah's you know, just <laughs> nodding. <laughs> Well, me too, me too. She's like, yep, I hear that. And just to clarify, it was me too that my husband also crapped his pants. <laughs> yeah. uh, I would love to hear about some of the women you meet, how you find these women, any incredible stories you have that you would love to share. I I mean, the stories they tell are always just so wild. Like, it, 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 they're so far out there. It's almost like when you're listening to them, like, it's hard to relate or even imagine these are real things they've been through. So a lot of times, like when we go to groups, every visit's really different. Um, sometimes there's a language barrier. Sometimes, you know, um, especially women who were previously trafficked, you know, they don't, sometimes they don't want to meet us or, you know, so it's it's always really different. But when, when women are willing to sit down and kind of talk to us about, you know, their past and the change they've been able to see, um, those are the ones that always really stick with me. And and if anything, I think we come home from those trips just wanting to work that much harder and reach that many more women. Yeah. So um, on different visits, we've heard everything from domestic violence has decreased within the homes now that they have their own income. And that's obviously huge and really hard to process. Another thing that we hear is that when women have their own income, that they then choose to send both the daughters and the sons to school because in so many of these communities, if you have enough money to send one kid to school, the son's going to go. The daughter stays home to work. Um, So even being able to change that and send girls to school is a big deal because that really helps to break the cycle of poverty. And marriage. Yeah, and child marriage. Um, A lot of times girls are married off because they're a financial burden to their family. So if there's extra money in the household and the girl is no longer considered that burden, then hopefully you can prevent child marriage. And then another thing we often hear is that really simple health problems like worms decrease because mothers start to buy their kids healthier foods. So really preventable diseases can now actually be prevented just because women have more money. Wow. And so the 
because you are a nonprofit, the funds that are produced from the sales of these goods, does it go back into that specific community that you purchase it from? Or what do you guys do with it? So the way our model is, we part of our commitment to fair trade is that we um, we pay fair wage. And that means a couple of things. One, there's actually a fair wage calculator to determine the fair wage for each community based on the cost of living. So rather than in a typical retail uh, model where you might actually bargain with the brand to say, hey, I need it cheaper, we're kind of the opposite. We say, how much do you need to be paid for this? And then what we do when we set our prices, again, totally untraditionally, is we figure out what we think we can sell them for based on what else is out there in the marketplace. And then we just go with whatever margin that is, which is very often um, very, very, very little. Yeah. I think, you know, a lot of nonprofits are set up so that they do something in order to raise money and then donate it. Whereas our main goal is to is to help these women support themselves and give them a platform to sell the goods. So, you know, that's our number one. You know, the, the money that we make, we are a business, obviously. So we have to reinvest. And so it's sort of like a, the more we sell, the more money we make. And then we can invest it into more product and reach other groups. So it's been a slow growth, but, you know, the more it grows, the more it picks up, which is really exciting because, you know, five years in, that's where we're, we're, we are now. And yeah, when Lauren says slow growth, we've been really, really cautious with spending money because it's so important to us that every cent is spent as wisely as possible because it, we've seen the way it can transform lives. So even just something like growing the team can be really overwhelming because we want to make sure we're making the right decisions for the nonprofit. Um, but it really, just like anything, you know, the the more like Lauren said, the more products we sell, the more people we help. So even, you know, when we started, we worked with nine artisan groups in five countries, and now we're almost at 70 groups in almost 30 countries. Wow. And each of those, it's almost, um, when you think about it from the production side, that's almost like production with 70 different groups, probably in 10 different languages all with very, very different needs. So Shipping's fun. Yeah, so shipping's fun. Oh, my fun. gosh. Yeah. Yeah. But so all of that takes a team. So being that you guys are both somewhat new moms, not not totally, you're a little... Am I still new? I'm like a year and a half in. Yeah, I don't know. I feel new. like you can be a new mom until you're, I don't know, they're like two or three. Oh, all right. <laughs> um, I don't know. I just made that up. Yeah. <laughs> How has having kids changed your empathy and or identifying with these some of these women who have kids and they're and you know knowing that we live in the states coming from drastically different situations yeah I think that I mean you know this once you become a mother you realize that there's literally nothing you wouldn't do for your child and to not be able to provide for them is just it's unimaginable so I I think that we understand now you know how important it is that we work with more and more women so that they can you know take care of their children. Yeah, I mean, it was before Lauren, Lauren and I started this before we were moms, but we knew that moms were important. We knew we wanted yeah. to do something to support women and children. But I think after becoming moms, that has such a deeper meaning. Because for example, like one of the groups we work with in Chicago, all the women there are at-risk young moms who have experienced domestic violence and homelessness. And I think it's it makes it so real to see, one, this is just, these are girls living in the U.S. Two, it's really, I mean, with how hard it is to be a mom, it's really, really hard to imagine doing that all while being a teen, let alone experience domestic, experiencing domestic violence or homelessness. And so I think it, it, it makes us care more and makes us want to work harder on their behalf. And that's, that's part of why we want to be able to grow because um, there's so many women all over the world that need help and want to break the cycle of poverty. And we kind of see our mission as economic empowerment for women um, through dignified job opportunities. So I think it just makes us want to work that much harder. Totally. So one of the things, and I'm not asking you how you guys achieve balance because I hate that question. <laughs> so easy. It's so easy. Being that you have many roles, you have many different hats. Kind of, I call them hats. Okay, good. Thank you. You have yeah. many different hats, yeah. several different companies, mom of one, mom of two. How do you live your hustle? First of all, I really like that. That way of putting it. <laughs> I don't I don't take credit for it. Ariane Goldman, who launched Hatch, mm -hmm. she, she calls it a beautiful hustle. Oh. And I was like, yeah. by the way, I reference good. you all the time. It makes it sound so much cooler than that. <laughs> I mean, for me, honestly, like I'm, I'm still figuring it out. Obviously, it comes down to priorities and those are constantly changing. And I think it's 
you're not always going to be perfect. I I have a really supportive partner, um, my husband, and he gets it. I think it's really important to check in on all of your relationships, whether it's me and Hannah, you know, and the and the nonprofit, or if it's me and my husband, or kind of making sure I'm I'm doing all the right things as a mother. I think it's it's important to just constantly be aware because you can get so busy where you're just sort of in survival mode. Um, which is never great. And sometimes you have to take a step back and say, I have to cut back on something. You know, what's the least important thing here? Unfortunately, it's it's usually work, um, <laughs> which isn't always easy to cut back on. But I, yeah, I think it's just being self-aware and being honest with yourself and, and knowing that you're not going to be perfect and, and hoping that people are forgiving of that. Emma? I think Lauren's taught me that it's okay to say no. Um, and I didn't really understand that. And I think I, that's one of the biggest lessons she's taught me is it, it's really OK, because I think it's so hard for women, especially to say no, because we want to please other people. And there's so, so many different aspects of our lives from our friends, our families, our careers. Um, and it's hard to keep all of those going at once. I think right now I'm deep in the hustle. I feel like with holidays <laughs> well. coming up, I'm just kind of I'm probably running on empty. So if you see me spacing out, that's why because there's not a lot left. Um, no, but <laughs> I think um, I try to be really present when I'm home. I try to do emails after my kids go to bed. I try to drop off my daughter whenever I can at school, especially with a new baby. That made things even more challenging because I really wanted to make sure that she um, didn't feel like she was being pushed aside when he came. So I definitely overcompensated and spend way more time with my daughter than I do with my son, which makes that really hard too, because he's so sweet um, and is almost six months old and I'm not sure where that time went but now with work I'm trying to hand off more um, and because we have such a great team I just need to do better just saying okay you guys have got this I'm not going to get involved I think I mean and you know this when you build something from the ground up it's so scary to hand over things to other people because you know no one's going to care as much as you do but you can <laughs> find someone who cares almost as much and you know they have a lot to prove and We've been really fortunate with the people we work with, and we have such a great team. Um, obviously, you know, you have to make changes if things don't work out, and you kind of have to find that right balance. We've, yeah, we've been really lucky, I feel like. But yeah, it's hard to let go of stuff when you're like... Really hard to let go of stuff. And then you're stuff. looking, whether it's, you know, social media or product development, and then you're looking, you're like, I would have done this differently, and you kind of start to, like, fall back into it, but then you realize that this is great too. And just because it's not the way I, I would have done it doesn't mean it's incorrect. And, you know, those choices are hard to make, but they're very important. Yeah, I felt that immediately after I had my first son, I was like, oh, wow, I really have to let go if I want to be a present mom. And I just have to allow it to like, maybe not be the way that I would do it, but let someone else do it so I can have a little bit of momness. Yeah, it's hard. So you both uh, decided to open up in brick and mortar. Mm hmm what was the inspiration behind that and where is the store located? It's Hannah. It was Hannah's dream. <laughs> <laughs> the brick and mortar was my dream um, because I really felt like with handmade goods, it's so different to see them in person. And even just with online shopping as popular as it is now, it's so different when you fall in love with something in person. And so I really felt like we could do these projects justice if people could touch and feel them. And um, it would give us an opportunity to share the stories of the makers. Um, so we opened up in the Palisades Village um, just about five weeks ago. So it's still very, very new. I I was way more. I mean, she was so optimistic. And I just, you know, I've been in retail for a while. And I know that, you know, there's really great things about it. And there's really scary parts. And again, like we said, we try to make very responsible decisions because it's a nonprofit. So I was hopeful, but just so nervous. And it's really exceeded expectations and actually helped online business as well. So this, I know it is early. I'm I'm calling it a win. And I'm calling so, it a win. Yeah, I know. I know I'm so scared. <laughs> but you know what? It's so beautiful. And she's right. Like as we do have like a lot of um, one of a kind pieces too. And this is, those are our favorite, you know, when we can say, just do what you do. Like you make such beautiful things. Like we don't want to tell you like, you know, we need 40 of this color. Like you know, a lot of it's like hand embroidered. We're like, you know, do what you were taught. Like we love to be able to in any way help preserve techniques and traditions. Well, and that's also been one of the challenges with having artisan made goods online is traditionally if these women are weaving a pillow or weaving a basket, they come up with each new pattern based on what they feel like that day. And with the orders we have to place the way we have to place them online to please our customers, we have to say, no, this blue star has to be exactly the same shape every time, same size. 
and the same shade of blue. And that's not how most of these artisans have worked. Um, so it's kind of, sometimes it feels sad to kind of push them into a box when we really love the creativity. Um, but photographing every single item is not an option either. So the store is really going to give us an opportunity to bring in pieces that can really showcase each artisan's unique designs. So do you have someone from your company literally traveling around all the time? No, but we probably should. <laughs> no. That's why a lot of these products take so long. I mean, you'll ship samples back and forth. And yeah, I mean, if we're ever like our our last trip we took out of the U.S., we were in where were we? we were in Mexico City and then we drove for six hours and I have we no, went, idea, oh my no idea where we were. We went to Chiapas. And so we we went and it's like up these hills. It actually looked it looked like Hawaii. It was wild because we left Mexico City. We drove forever. And um, it was like, you know, kind of waterfalls everywhere and palms and just like not kind not what you picture when you think of Mexico. And we went and then we were like on this dirt road forever. And we went into um, this little town. And this is where they made these embroidered pillows that are so pretty. And the first thing we noticed when we pulled up, some girls sitting around a tree and they have those kind of back looms. So it's um, a strap behind their back and then it's tied to the tree. And they were weaving and they weren't even looking. Like it was, it was almost like muscle memory. And they were doing these like intricate patterns. And you could tell they had, like they had just done them for so long. And it's, I wish I had taken video. I Maybe Yoni did, but it is, it was wild to watch. And I stood behind them for a few minutes. And then we went and we, we basically were like, we need to put in an order now because I think there was like one cell phone there. <laughs> like, we don't know how we're going to get this back and forth. And there was like, they, they didn't speak Spanish. They spoke. Yeah. On top of that, they spoke a local dialect. So yeah. we had an English to Spanish translator who would then translate to the local dialect and then back to us. So every, every conversation took forever. Yeah. But we literally, Lauren was like, let's pick our thread colors here and yeah. now. They brought out like a basket of thread and we picked out our favorite colors, wow. showed the shape we wanted and said, weave whatever pattern you want. Because they obviously, I mean, that it was amazing. But then the challenge is even now within those pillows online, we have to say, weave whatever you, whatever. Well, here's the color, but actually the pattern has to be the same because our customers care if the pattern varies. Yeah, especially if you're buying a set as throw pillow, you know what Tone. I mean? Yeah, Tone. so, but that's the nice thing about the stores. They can come in and, and I think people actually appreciate that they're handmade and they are all unique in their own way, so. So what's some advice you'd give to women or the, the two men that probably listen to this podcast? Um, <laughs> Hello. Hi, uh, <laughs> thanks for listening. <laughs> they want to give back. They want to do more. It seems overwhelming. They don't just want to write a check. What would you say? Well, Hannah, aside, yeah, aside from supporting little Mark. Yeah, I was going to say Hannah's going to be better because I actually like whenever there's something happening at Hannah's like my first text. I'm like, OK, what's the best? What's the best way to help here? Um, unfortunately, it actually usually is money. Um, but I think it's just everyday choices. It's thing like Hannah uses organic as as an example a lot, because not only is it better for you, but you have to keep in mind the people that are growing and harvesting and not having to deal with chemicals. So I think you just kind of be thoughtful in, pro in your purchases like that. And I, I think that it's sometimes that's a little overwhelming. It's sort of like when people are like, you need to be green and vegan and all these things. Like, I think it's just like maybe once a day, like making a, you know, a thoughtful choice and just little changes like that. Yeah, I think um, to that point, I always talk about shopping as voting with your dollars. So if you choose to purchase from brands that you like, whether you like their messaging or how it's made um, or the design that you really are casting a vote. So I think that's a real, I mean, everybody's shopping every day or buying something. Um, so I think that's a really way, a really easy way to make an impact um, with something you're already doing. So what would you say about the thing you've learned most about yourself since starting this company? It doesn't have to be one thing, but like, the th or what stands out to you the most? I think I've learned that I'm a workaholic. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I feel like that's a more recent um revelation but i i real i mean it's it's i feel like it's kind of snuck up on me um or now i just end up doing emails end up working on the um weekend and i have to actually like set limits with myself like no you're, you're not going to do that this weekend if it doesn't get done at the end of the week it's fine and just leave it yeah i figured that out about myself with my third with starting the female fa founder collective i was like wait i have to do this i have to do this and i was like wait it's okay like it can happen on Monday and I, I can't get out of that mentality that I have to do it all now. Oh, guys, it means you love what you do. That's true. It's so nice. That is true. Yeah. I think I think that one thing I've learned in all of this, because again, Hannah comes from a background of nonprofit. And I think one of the things about running a nonprofit is, and she's so good about this, is she's like, 
people can say no, but like it never hurts hurts to ask. I'm I I hate asking people for things. But I think that one of the things I've learned is that people care and people want to help. And I think if you give them an opportunity, you know, they usually are happy to do so. And and I think when you're speaking on the behalf of others, you're not like asking them for a personal favor. You're saying, you know, here's a here's a way you can help. I think that people are always are really happy to do that and um, it's good, especially, you know, in times like these when things are a little scary. It, it's good to have that reminder that there's a lot of people that really care and just want to help others. So um, I asked two questions um, on this podcast. The first one being, hopefully the people listening need a good dose of advice or need something to help jumpstart their day. So what is any piece of advice on any subject that you'd love to leave our listeners with? Um, one thing I started doing a really long time ago is if I was having a bad day or a bad week and I was just starting to feel sorry for myself, I think perspective is so important. And um, that can mean different things to different people. It can mean kind of, I mean, like if I had, I've had a bad day and then gone in and like, or gone online and donated to something to try and feel better, which is kind of selfish. <laughs> but um, one thing I do is sometimes is I, I make a list of all the things that are good in my life to remind me that those often outweigh the bad or whatever's bothering me. And I think that that gives me perspective and it kind of, you know, it helps me, I don't know, feel a little more grateful, not feel bad for myself. This is an advice, but adding on to the ad, I think it's so important. I think so many people look at social media or look at celebrities and assume everything's going well at all times. Um, And I think it's so important to remember that everybody around you is going through something um, and to treat them that way. You know, it's just like if someone cuts you off or or doesn't open a door for you, I think realize that it might be more about them than about you. And maybe they just had a terrible day. So that's just a random thought. Um, but my advice is to choose the people around you really carefully. Um, I think energy is so contagious. And when you spend your time with people who are loving and caring and kind and do good, that feels so different than people who drain you. And also when you have kind of like a bad apple in your crew, it keeps people away from you. Other good people aren't going to want to be around you if you're around someone that's not this kind. Um, so I think really like our, our time and our energy is everything. So really looking to spend that with good people. I like and to it. use the term bad apple. That was just really <laughs> cute. <laughs> that was like the nicest way. You're just a bad apple. Just a bad you have to say it with an yeah, accent right? like this. It sounds like a... My mother-in-law. Yeah. She's just a bad apple. Yeah. <laughs> Don't hang around her. <laughs> so what would be the surprise to know about you, Hannah? I don't know, but I can tell you what people don't know about Lauren. Oh, I like this. I'm flipping this. Yeah, let's flip flip it. Okay. Well, I think she's really funny, and I don't know that everybody knows that. But then my mom always wants to make sure everybody knows (laughs) that Lauren is a really talented artist. Oh, every Erica. Yeah, I mean, everything from, like, interior design and her actual sketches. Like, Lauren is very, very talented, and I don't know that everybody knows that. I love that. It's really nice, Anna. Thank Mm -hmm. you. I went to art college. (laughs) (laughs) She did. (laughs) Uh, okay hannah so this is it's funny because hannah like i told her i was like you're such an open book yet i do get surprised sometimes just because she's so unfiltered so she'll say something and i'll be like oh okay i don't think this is necessarily surprising to know about hannah but i think it's one of my favorite things about her hannah i sort of have to explain mean girling to her because she's that pure of a person Like she, I, I love know, that. right? I know. So like I, and this is again like how we're, I mean, we're very much alike in a lot of ways, but we're so different. Like my roots are in reality television. Like my job was to cry in public and fight with people. And Hannah is like, like I'll have to explain to her why like one girl is mad at another and how, how it all works. And I just love that she doesn't always understand it because it comes from such a good place of like, she's never like even felt those negative feelings or like, it's all just like so sweet. And I love having having that. I love that. Well, just I mean, I was really mean in fourth grade. Just set the record. Straight. <laughs> it all went downhill from it there. Did. And you just turned into a nice person. I remember the teacher had a conference with all the kids in the class while I went to the rat room because I was so mean and she needed to and then figure you made, that out. And then you made a life change. <laughs> well, this has been lovely <laughs> on that note. <laughs> on that note. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Yeah. It's great. That was Lauren Conrad and Hannah Sparla of The Little Market. Please visit their website, thelittlemarket.com, and buy something because you will change a woman's life when you do. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to read some reviews. Again, this is my fuel. 
next review is from Murphy Design, D-E-E. I'm always in search of inspiration in the morning and during drive time, and I just found it. Rebecca nailed it. Thank you so much, Murphy Design. I hope that you continue to listen to me while you're driving. Again, I love these reviews. I love hearing from you, so please keep it up, and thanks for listening to Superwomen. 